Um, have we finished off that pizza, I hope? Yes. Good. We shouldn't even be frequenting pizzas, you know? The difficulties Italians gave me in my growing up, and what they give black folks now, they got to do their own pizza. And selling drugs out of the pizzerias and, and whatnot, mafia connection. In fact, you should stay away from Chinese food too. Right. And Japanese. Yeah. Sushi. Sushi. Don't buy no Japanese car. Only Jeffrey Fritters. Can we uh, um, have an attention, please? After what that Japanese man said. Um, our brothers in Westchester have produced another issue of the paper, and um, on the network. And you see, some of us are featured. The workshop is featured. And uh, we need to congratulate them because, you know, they've done a very good job. Here's the inner, inner um, <laughs> the battle for curriculum wages on. And then they have a shot of myself. Then they have Professor Scobie speaking to us. All right. Very Price and myself. And then they have uh, Sensei. Uh, great, come out. When right. he was uh, dealing with it, so um, they have been doing what the African media should be doing in projecting as uh, some serious work done by by our, our community. So that let's support them as as much as we can uh, in terms of the paper, so that they can grow and expand. Um, so we have some outside uh, on the desk. There's some here, so we can. Uh, now, the young, man, young African warriors, this is some of our African community series in trying to develop a curriculum, not a curriculum of inclusion, we're going to include it, but they're developing a curriculum of liberation. And they're working on it not from the point of view of putting it in the school system only, but putting it in the home, putting it in the playground, putting it in the community center, putting it in the church, and then marching it into the school. Uh, because it's going to be difficult for the school teachers to deal with what we're talking about in terms of the significance of uh, the African Foundation of Human Experience and us taking control of our, our education and our development. Um, but that's a responsibility we have. And so this group has been meeting for months uh, working on these type of uh, things. I'm glad to see we have our sister, uh, Diane Glover, here, who is uh, a crucial part of the struggle for African education liberation. She works closely with Adelaide Sanford and has tried to put a support system around Adelaide. And she's supportive in the different struggles that we are involved in. She was also selected to be a member of the distinguished 23-member committee put in place by the Chancellor Sobel oh. to revise the curriculum. <laughs> one of our most distinguished members of the committee because she's got to keep a watch on Schlesinger and whatever Diane Ravitch may try to do working in and around them and, and even Ali Maziri can't be trusted for so much. Uh, so she, Diane has an enormous job uh, and but Sister Glover is up to the task but she needs our support and anything she wants um, we've got to uh, help her with. So uh, Diane feel free that you can uh, hook into this group and its larger extension uh, to get anything that you need, any type of support. If you need us to come up there and bring 200 people up there to look like we represent two, you know, 200,000, then we'll do that. And these brothers are serious about their growth and development. And so, um, they were just in my office looking at some of the books. They were glad to hook up with Professor Scobie so that he can be invited out to participate with them. And uh, one of the brothers is at Bronx Science, so he wants us to possibly come later in the year with some of the students at Bronx Science who's had this leadership group there. And also, um, they understand that they need to form study groups. It's not just a matter of grappling uh, or getting the message across, but it's also growth and development. And so, just as we are organizing in study groups, um, they realize that it's got to be done. Somebody approached me today and mentioned that Kermit Ely, the head of um, the Black United Fund, uh, wants to work with setting up study groups in the buildings that they're working with. So that's eventually where ASCAP wanted to go. Study groups on every corner, uh, in every community center, in every youth center, 
and this is something that they, white folks can't control. You, Diane Ravitch can't do nothing with this. Even Tom Sobel can't put any problems in this. And certainly Mayor Koch and uh, Governor Cuomo can't deal with it. So the whole study group process is our way of, of setting up a foundation under our community. And as you know, uh, those of you who don't have the power <laughs> pack, the African power pack, you better get a hold of the African power pack. Right. Otherwise, you won't know about the Statue of Liberty. You won't have the documentation. Right. Uh, you won't have the documentation of putting white folks in those caves. So you've got to put the white folks in the caves at least 25,000 years. If you don't put them in 25,000 years, you're in trouble. And, uh, but it's a documented 25,000 years. It's not something that we just fathom down of our imagination. So you go to the videotape, go to Newsweek. Uh, the way they were, put them in the cage 25,000 uh, years. That's why they're upset with me, because the documentation is there, and the analysis is there, and also the black Adam and Eve is, uh, is here. And then, uh, of course, in the Power Pack, we have a study on South Africa that I did, uh, which a lot of you should get into, uh, because there's some serious analysis in terms of really what's happening in South Africa, in terms of the land, in terms of that value system of debt that chosen people value system that comes out of the Africana church. You know, we had talked about the church yesterday and the role that the church can play in devilishness. And if you want to see what Christianity can do in terms of devilishness, you need to see it in South Africa. On the black side, as well as on the white side, as well as on the Dutch side, as well as on the English side, as well as on the colored side, as well as on the Asian side. The devastation of the Christian ideology of death and white supremacy is right there for everybody to see. And when I was with the World Council of Churches in 83 in Geneva, I had it firsthand uh, to get the knowledge of me. So the brothers, I want to give them uh, the power pack. And this is for some serious study. And out of this, some of your inspiration and some of your is doing some heavy work, I tell you, with some of the, the uh, material he's already uh, presented in terms of the conspiracy and free your African mind and Asiatic static. So uh, hopefully they can be a model of what some of the other uh, groups can do. And it's happening. I was in the post office a couple of weeks back, minding my own business, about 1 o'clock at night, and a young fellow came up to me and he was with one of the big groups. I mean, I, uh, what, KRS or something like I mean, what? And he said, Dr. Jimmy, how you doing? So we would sit and chat and talk. And, and then getting heavy into African history. And, and the white man across the way was minding his own business, getting his nails together. And before he knew it, he had to interrupt us. <laughs> and he's tie in jacket, pinstripe suit, Harvard graduate. And of course, you know, I kicked butt as probably should be done. <laughs> and I got tired of him. And I just left him there and went to take care of my business at the mail uh, window. And this young brother took care of business. I mean, I mean, I was so proud to see him take on the Harvard graduate and just wipe it and put out. And, you know, so I said, if this is what happened with the young people, I said, wow, we can go We may have something here. You know? And uh, he did give me his little card and stuff, so I have to remember. But this is happening all the time. You meet these. Um, Young fellas really trying to grow and develop. But of course, all we see on the TV screen mm -hmm. is people being dragged off uh, for some uh, unnecessariness that they've been bothered. So, what I would like to see the brothers do, you know, whenever we open up our activities or end it, we usually have something special. So, if you can just do something for us. You know, you ain't on stage now, you're with your family now. This is like, <laughs> just, you know, like we used to be on the step and the stoops and North doing our little ditty bopping. You remember those things, Camille. You ain't as young as you act. <laughs> and any of you who want the uh, package, we do have a $10 fundraiser for our students on the trip to Africa. Well, that was the trip. Trip. Well, well, the 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 See, his brothers are getting, and they're anticipating what's in this. We're like, we want to read it now. We, <laughs> we want to, because we've been waiting. Anyway, my name is Dexter. Okay. At least the name that I've been given by my mother is Dexter. I'm searching for that real one. We're going to find it one day. Um, these are the brothers of war. At least some of them, the ones that can make it tonight, the ones that um, the ones in the organization that try to spearhead things when they go down. Um, as I said before, my name is Dexter. This is Mark, the black man's advocate. This is S.Y., who I call a lyrical genius. This is Juca, Juca's the man, Juca. And this is Brett, 
be funk. And there's a long story behind that name. Anyway, as I said before, this is war. We are warriors against ignorance, and then we try to combat it in every way possible, in any form that it comes in. So black man's out of here. Tell them that you know. Yo, I'm a rising. So stop the criticizing. I'm sick and tired of brothers hypnotizing other brothers with fake prophecy and proverbs. So now it's time to get what they deserve. Get your facts straight. Read a book about yourself and put your attitudes on the shelf. Cause many have tried to lead this revolution. They all have died and no solution is upon us cause we are still looking for the answers. We won't find a walk around like gangsters shooting up a party, killing your brother's man. Can't you see you getting jailed by the other man? My history and his, they don't coincide. Doing life for petty crimes, that's genocide. All about money, cash flow, green currency. That is the cause of drug addiction and delinquency. Without it, there'd be no fat cap kingpins. The black loses as long as the green wins. Start realizing and stop antagonizing your brothers and sisters cause it's you that we despising. It's quite surprising. You're always idolizing all the negative minds cause with them you're socializing. You need schooling, a little education on a black race and the growth of a black nation. Don't mean to sound radical or derogatory, but learn your history, not his story. Black power has been around for many centuries. We've been suppressing the press, but not eventually everyone will know. They read it in the history books, then our kids will know their colors, not connected with crooks. I'm sick and tired of paying the price for all the brothers that committed the crime. It took a fall. Brothers, stop the violence and start to understand the labels of the packages, not for no black man. Mm. <laughs> Here we go. You can get it. I want to do this for the clap, but I don't have a very strong voice to bounce off the back of the wall like his does. So he can just get the rhythm. Here we go. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Ready? Bend don't break, but someone even bend. Go with the flow or you're snapping the wind. Some sleepy night lights, but they're afraid of my dark. When I'm a shadow running wild in midnight's park. Not selling out because some must be a sales pitch. To make more money, you do an attitude switch. See, I don't buy themselves in Cali and Miami. They ain't saying nothing. That's why they get a Grammy. Uncle Tom all dated, bubblegum overrated. Acting like they know that the rhyme flow was constipated. Thorns on a rose bush, out in my petals. More soldiers dying than those coming with medals. Trying to tame a line, but deep is disappointed. Struck by a coin, your body's destroying you. I'm not a verbalizer, I'm an MC. I sold monkey wrench and government machinery. I think they know me. They try to ban me. A southern senator will flux clan me. I'm not a communist, I'm a black activist. I suffer hard in the hands of a racist. But since I've gotten all the world gets along, I'm crazy, my mind's a ticking time bomb. I took my confidence, called it arrogance. It's a shame when you make the wrong comparison. Although my book sense, you gotta have common sense. But your actions should make no kind of sense. If you're a weak and tall, you should prepare to fall. System X has got behind the eight ball. I didn't start this war, I never killed before. But it seems it's exactly what they're asking for. So it's a step to you, the letter 24. Either retreat, attack, or since he hit the floor. I went up slave chains, cause I'm not a slave. And I get pissed when they say that I cannot behave. Here you coming, redneck, wearing your cowbells. Went to Naya Bingies and bought some conch shells. Then I spread my wings to do my walk sore, metamorphosize. Then I do my lion's roll. <laughs> Before, my name is Esquire. It stands for Everyone Stupid, Quickens, Unintentional Racial Extermination. <laughs> Everyone Stupid, Quickens, Unintentional Racial Extermination. So, um, thanks to Professor Jeffries, I've become more of an analyst now in terms of my, um, the, what I bring through my raps. Um, I guess I do sort of a little collage, and, you know, just to make it equally. <laughs> um, what's going on in the brains of the future? The mind is severely distorted to suit the needs of a white supremacist to take control of a black body and soul. Now, which is the more successful door, black or white? The little man picks the one that's light. Why? Because the other door is dark, and black is tagged with a failing mark. Now which is the prettier door, white or black? The girl thinks white is the obvious fact. The U.S. cracker, he looks so smugly. Cause now this girl thinks black is ugly. African American youth never get truth. And what's next is an inferior complex. The cut so deep that it's bound to scar the mind of a child that's so into Barbie. And while Barbie drives a Corvette, running shoes are all Flojo gets. It's all a scam, the blacks in bedland. If he doesn't hear the conspiracy, poor little Sambo, nobody knows. The pain from the blows of the blackface shows. 
Told her to tell all the tales they were telling. Boys wearing shoe polish, eating watermelon. A disgrace to Sambo and his brother Cool. The names they were given in the Nightmare is cartoon. You really think the eyes would go forward when they about to compete with Battleship Lift? You better think now, nah, Mammy's the mother. Bad with a bandana wrapped on her head, talking to the master with a man of Lord Show. Was generous to provide you. Wish it was at least good enough for what behind you. Wash one in one hand, tell Ben another. Mammy is the nanny and she's handy as a close brother. Husband, uncle, glued to a fiddle. Smiles in his teeth, tooth missing in the middle. All these types of pipe at the time were ripe as they mark the after. Kids, darky, a nigga. This kind of ethnic blow is gone on a brother that I never call Sam. Go freedom, free your dome, liberate the mind. The demon has you confined, confused, confounded, they compounded lies. Got your men fully surrounded, trapped. Go on the lap in captivity. Shackled the Africans thought they were mastering bodies and souls, so they went for the spirit. Took out a whip, made your forefather fear it. Our ancient mothers were raped, refused to warm the bed, and they were dead. Causing this modernistic picture could have been authentic, now what a mixture. A non prejudiced explanation why the world, not just a nation, is a melting pot or pan. Done by the hand of Captain Caveman. Tell me why this tribulation is not a cut by so called education. I say so called by simply explaining that they insist on training. It takes a well, a well trained dog to roll over, beg, walk upon its hind legs. Otherwise, that dog is a fool on how to survive, but he thinks it's cool. How could they arrive at this conclusion? Saying the black man made no contribution. Hope one putting out an illusion. African descent will get struck dumb. They better save a temporal contusion and get quick to kick with an infusion. I put a better yet put an effective inclusion of truth into the curriculum. Get the crap out of my face on the properties of Rodicus, Aristotle, Socrates, and Socrates. Because a lot of these men, the, a lot of these men, the man believed to be followers of thought were thieves. The scriptures on the pyramid Know thyself. Materialists never share the bump. There is a royal richness you can't find, or it's a free your African mind. Extending my hand and thanks to all of you and Professor Jeffries for having us here. We, like I said, started our organization, but we're just at that fetal stage, waiting to be born into something spectacular. Mm -hmm. So we're just hoping that we can have all the help that you're willing to give in making what we're trying to do possible. And we're willing to give to you everything that we can as your brothers and you as our sisters and brothers. So you all ready to we'd have a little opening up. <laughs> Something serious. Now, what we hope to do is to take that energy and that consciousness and figure out how something can be done for the one and two and three year olders. And so when they go into the school, they go in rapping. <laughs> you know, our history. And the teacher is looking to find Dick and Jane and give it to them. And they talk about Nzinga and Harriet Tubman. And uh, so we'll work with the brothers and we'll extend any help that they need, including financial help to make sure that they get their stuff on wax and whatnot. So that uh, that's a commitment that we will make. Yeah. I'm glad that you all came. And so we just hook it up the way we need to. Yeah. but I think Professor Scobie needs to say a few words to calm us down. Fascinating. This is a close range to the beautiful brothers. Yes. And you know, while I was listening to them, everything was going down in my mind. I was saying, this is another power, powerful area that we need in our armory for finding ourselves. Yeah. Let us not be light about it. No. It's very moving and serious, and the fact that it's coming from such beautiful young minds yeah. must yeah. mean 
that the message is going on around to an African family. Yes. We have now come to the stage where I'm sure we are going to we include not only the elders and the older ones and the not so old ones, but we have now have our young people That's seeing right. what That's we're right. seeing mm -hmm. and putting it in the way that young people put things today. And I think we may not take it light because this is a serious inclusion in the African struggle. Mm -hmm. And um, how far it will go further, we will just see. But it's a, something that we are developing, and I now see the development in its totality. And I see another thing that it brings to us is the fact that we as an African family, wherever we may be now, are getting together in a unified way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Once you can get your young, your youngsters with you, your children with you, and talking the way they are talking yes. through a, a, a through a media a medium that is entirely belonging. If it's done in the face of America today, it's our is our youth like these beautiful brothers yes. and who are else, other other places too who have brought it before us. At one time, I know we would say that oh rap and say rap, you know, and t and the older ones tend to think oh we have nothing to do with that, but if we don't have that with us as a component of this ongoing struggle. A struggle is going to go. The brothers have said we are at war. Mm -hmm. And their, their weapons that they're using is the most powerful mm -hmm. one. Yes. And I welcome them into the family. And it's always the elder must do it. Yes. I welcome you. Oh. Thank you. Now, I don't know what their timetable is, but um, or anybody's timetable, but we do have, uh, as this was the appetizer, and it turned out to be a main course. <laughs> but the entree is our brother Booker T. Right. <laughs> and he has been laboring in the vineyard and mastering how you can take her his knowledge and, and this explosion of African light and package it into uh, a process where the children can have it in the school system. And he's been working in District 9, a troubled district, but he's been a stalwart and trying to develop things there. And he's had a team of people who had Jerry in, he has uh, for the Collinsworth, and Booker, and others who have been working and put together a serious curriculum, including lesson plans. So while the Commissioner of Education sold the word about what the vision could be made, they were actually making it and just ignoring it at the beginning for several years. The delegates from Iraq, the PLO, Yemen, and Sudan walked out of the meeting Thursday to protest the defeat of a resolution denouncing the United States. And what can be done? So that, uh, even though we talk about the Portman Award, it's based on SA District 9 on this side of the continent has been doing some serious work. So uh, if we can give a special African welcome to uh, so the report. natural for this to happen. It became part of the life system. And just as it becomes part of the life system in the college, what we began to see in our young people, we saw the same thing evolving. First of all, I would like to tell you that this works. Culture works. I work with children from kindergarten through junior high school. And for those teachers, and we do have teachers here who are working in the process and have classes, and what's so important is something I'd like to even begin with by letting you know. Uh, there was a brother standing in a puddle of water who was conscious, and it happens, and it works. So we don't need to get into the dialogue about whether or not uh, the state is going, to, is going to say it's going to work, should we work. They have a five-year plan. I can tell you all about the state. So can Ms. Glover. Diane Glover can tell you, because she's working on the curriculum. 
please understand what is happening between now and the time they decide to include it. Because, see, this is a game now. Because, first of all, they got us on the wrong track. They got us thinking about a curriculum of inclusion. So that all of a sudden, a couple of years from now, when this gosh darn awful curriculum is finally put in place, they're going to say, okay, let's give it to them. We have to understand the tracks. Right now, they are planning to undermine the program. This is what this time is taking right now. They're thinking of a way to divert, because I want to tell you where this multicultural curriculum came from. It came from Brooklyn. It came from the Bronx. It came from those conscious African Americans who many years ago, maybe five or six years ago, said that it is wrong to have a curriculum that does not include Africa. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Do you remember, I believe it was Reverend Daughtry and a few other ministers and community activists stood up and said it couldn't happen? Let me tell you what happens in multicultural. When we do staff development sessions and we start talking about the glory of Africa, you see a hand raised. Say, but wait a minute, what about the Italians? We have a history. What about the Irish? We have a history. You, do, you, do you see what they did? Yeah. What they did is that they shifted the emphasis because they understand that when you take brothers like this yeah. and sisters who are their counterpart, and they become aware of who they are, what they are, where they are, and where they must go, what you have is the most dynamic force in this nation. <laughs> there is a great fear. So we don't need to be surprised when people of Asian background talk about it. We don't need to be surprised when people of other cultures begin to talk about us. And when I talk about the African diaspora, please understand what I say. I'm talking about the English-speaking, the Spanish-speaking, the French-speaking, the Dutch-speaking, the any-speaking people of African descent. Because this is another thing. They have divide and conquer. So that our Latino brothers and sisters do not see themselves wrapped up in us. They do not see that that same comedic origin, that same comedic legacy that we are so proud of applies to them as it applies to us. So they divide and conquer. They make them think that this doesn't apply to you. You have a culture. This is what this is. What we've got to do is clearly see where we fit in this and what we've got to do. To this end, what I would like to do, I would like to do this in two parts. There is no way I can cover everything that I'd like to tell you. But later on down the line, this, this will be in written form so that we can understand this. And I hope that what we begin to do, and what we can do by this evening, I would like to lay out a plan tonight that you can implement tomorrow morning to make a difference in your community. I've had an opportunity to work with parents, because you see, first of all, all of this means nothing without the parents. Please know that we have to do things simultaneously for this to work. Without the parents reinforcing this information and the spiritual aspect of what it is that we're doing, this will not work. It is the school, the administration, the parents, and the community. Because in some schools, we have people of the community who are conscious but do not have children in the school. Many schools say, well, in order to be on the parents association, you must be a parent, but that's fine. But if you are a community member, you have as much right in that school as anyone else. So we're going to talk about a couple of things. Tonight, what I'd like to do is I'd like to take you back. And the reason why I'm taking you back is because whenever we go on a road, you always have to look back to see where you started. And by the time we're finished today, we're going to understand that this curriculum of correction was in place in 1922. It was on its way into place by 1919. And that there was a dynamic brother who was putting this in place, who laid a road map, who showed us and who crystallized and personified what Dr. Clark has taught us for so long. And that is, is that a human being, male or female, can achieve anything as long as they don't run in the street talking about what they're doing. This brother was able to do things that changed the international world. And the reason why, and if I may ask at this point, how many of you have heard of, how many of you have not heard of Professor William Leo Hansen? Okay. Well, this evening, you're going to understand who Professor William Leo Hansberry was. I spoke to my sister Irma. And there were things that I was contemplating whether or not I should discuss. But I think that after i have been impacted by our brothers here, who are at war, I wanted to, I want to now, and I've consciously made this decision in listening to them. Because just as we inspired them, brothers, understand you inspire us. Because you're our future.
struggle is long, victory is assured yeah. as long as we are united. And as long as we understand that what is attempting to be done to us is not new. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, as we unfold this story of William Leo Hansberg, we are going to find that some of the worst people in his life was in practice. We really did a job on him on many different levels. But because this brother knew where he was going, it didn't bother him. Because he knew the road he was on. And when he was on this road, he just kept going. And we're going to write some models next week so that I can show you what I mean because I'm a very construct person. I like visuals. I like to see and then from seeing, draw out what we'd like to say in the concrete. William Leo Hansberg, born 1894, Gloucester, Mississippi. Brother was born to a, a family, Eldon and Pauline Hansberg. Eldon Hansberry was professor at Alcorn, uh, Alcorn A&M in Mississippi. Uh, he was a student of history. He was a teacher of history at Alcorn A&M. And what he did is he collected a library. This is Eldon Hansberry, the father. Collected a library on Greek and Roman history. Unfortunately, when William Leo Hansberry was three years old, his father Eldon passed away. However, that did not stop him. In fact, that was one of his motivating factors because he inherited his father's library. And I guess as a young brother, as most of our young brothers are, you know the ones in special education? Those brothers I'm talking about, those that do not have that male influence. He was influenced by his father's memory and by the books that he inherited. So he read these books. And as he was growing, he constantly heard references made to Ethiopia. A-E-T-H-I-O-P-I-A. -E -I -I and what began to happen was an interest in this. He went to Alcorn A&M uh, Grammar School because down the South in these days, and even maybe even now, uh, the colleges used to have high schools and used to have elementary schools, and you could almost go straight through uh, one full lifetime and, and graduate from college. He went to Alcorn A&M. He studied. But what happened in high school was that he didn't particularly care for the things that he was studying because there were things that were happening inside of him, which Dr. Richard King would call the collective unconscious. And it began to work on him, and it began to talk to him. And this information I am getting from his writing, from handwritten letters. And as we go through, I'm gonna tell you some of the backtracking that had to be done in order to find this out, because when we're talking about researching, and to my young brothers, and although our sisters may not be here who are in, do we have any young sisters who are in college that would be counterparts to our brothers up here? Well, in, in their absence, we'll speak in general because our sisters are their counterparts. And we must always keep this balance going. So our brothers and sisters, research, the ability to research, is just not about going into a book and reading. What it is is that as Dr. Jeffries has put his model down, and you're going to see this model appear throughout these two sessions that I have. What you have is the book. Well, I shouldn't put the book here. What you have is the interest. What makes you pick up the book? Then you have the book. But it does no good. You have to have a process going on. Something has to happen to make you think about the book. And what you find out about the book and the information that you're reading comes here. When I first began researching Professor Hansberry, I had an interest and I had material. But what I found out about him as I brought the two together allowed us to see the importance of the curriculum of correction. And why it is important that we do it now, no more talking. We must go back to Dr. Clark, as we always return to the mess. And we must understand that we must never put our ability in the oppressor's hands. Because if they had the ability to help us, they would destroy us. Please know that. Please know that the most dangerous thing that's happening among us today is consciousness. Mm -hmm. To see our brothers and sisters in high school, in grammar school, wearing arms, kinti cloth, all of these different things that are evolving. People always say what happened to the 60s. Well, the 60s became the 70s. The 70s became the 80s, and now we're in the 90s. This is a process of growth. This is evolution. This is like nun. The ta and the tongue. These brothers, being influenced 
having an interest in their culture is none. Their ability to be with a scholar such as Dr. Jeffries, Dr. Scobie, Professor Yarborough, and all those connected with CCNY then resurrect our young brothers and sisters to consciousness which is up to I like vision. You'll see a lot of these as we go through. In fact, next week you're going to see an experience job, because I'm going to get tired of writing here on this board all night long. <laughs> so I'm going to be able to flip these pages out of a while and we'll have no problem. <laughs> but what you have happening in William Leo Hansberry's life is that he's becoming interested around his sophomore year in high school. There's something happening to this brother, and you can see by the way he's writing. <coughs> Something is connecting with this brother. And what he begins to do and what he decides to do is that he transfers. He transfers to Knoxville. Knoxville in Tennessee. Now, mind you, he lives in Mississippi, but he wants to go to Tennessee. Something's happening to him. So what he does is he transfers to Knoxville, Tennessee. However, in Knoxville, Tennessee, there's a lot of agricultural courses. This brother wants to get down on some serious African knowledge. He's being uh, weighed down by courses in agriculture, demonstration agriculture. This brother says, yes, Booker T. Washington was a wonderful person, but there's something I'm after, and I can't find it in Knoxville. So he decides to go on to Atlanta University. And at, and at, at I'm sorry, and Atlanta University, he realizes that what's beginning to happen is that something else is beginning to occur. France Boas works begins to appear. Felix Dubois, Timbuktu the Mysterious begins to appear. A lot of different things start to happen. And what he decides to do is he's going to put all this down and he's going to start to read. When he read France Boas work and when he read uh, Felix Dubois work, which was published in Atlanta <coughs> University at this time, he says, where can I find more information? And he's having problems. But you know how the ancestors work with us, where they show us the way? He goes away during the summertime, and he's reading The Crisis done by Du Bois, and what he sees is an advertisement for a book called The Negro. He sends away for the book, and he reads the book. And when he reads this book by Du Bois, he realizes at this time, he has got to find the books on the bibliography. He returns to Atlanta University and he starts looking for the books. But at that time, Atlanta University didn't have the kinds of books that he wanted. He wanted books like uh, Lady Lugard, Lady Lugard's uh, A Tropical Dependency, because this was one of the books that the boys were. He wanted to see some of this because it was small capsules. The Negro, for those of us who have read it, it gives you good information, but it gives you the information in capsules, something like what they never taught you in history class. Capsules of information on ancient civilizations. But this brother wants to go deep now, you see. He's already read his daddy's work, and now he's read Felix Dubois' work, and he's read Frank Boa's work, and now he's got the crisis, and he decides he wants more. So he's looking all around for this work, and he can't find it anywhere. He goes and he asks, where can I find this work? And he comes upon the head of the sociology and history department, uh, John Bingham, and John Bingham, Professor John Bingham tells him, well, the only places you'll find these works is at Harvard, Columbia, or the Library of Congress. At this point, William Leo Hansberry's <coughs> life changes. Mind you now, he's moving around in many different places in the South. And for a young African-American male, at this time, to be doing this is phenomenal. But to be willing to take the sacrifice that he's about to take is even greater because the brother doesn't have the kind of money he needs. Remember, his mother has married by now, and he doesn't have the kinds of money he, he needs. So what he does is that he works, and he saves enough money to get to heart. That's all he has. It was at this point that the first thing that he does when he leaves, um, when he leaves Atlanta University is he comes up to Cambridge, Massachusetts, first thing he does is go to the library at all. It's the first thing he does. And he begins to read Lady Lugard's Tropical Dependency. This changes his entire image, his entire focus. And what he knows is that he's got to get into this information. However, guess what? The brother don't have no place to sleep that night. He doesn't have any money. So he's reading in the library. There's a gentleman sitting across from him. And when the guy finds out that Professor Hansberry, or at this time, young William Leo doesn't have a place to sleep. 
he invites him back to the dorm to bunk with him. So he does that. To make this all, this piece of the work short, sweet, to the point, because again, there's a lot I can say about this period. What William Leo Hansberry does is that he works in the dining halls of Harvard University. The very same students that he sits next to in class, he is serving them dinner and lunch and breakfast. But there's something in the back of this brother's mind yes. that when you read his biography by many people, unless you've gotten into the research, you might be led astray. And this is why it's so important that when we do research, that we do comparative research, that we not only go to what is written, but that we go to other things that refer back. Because when you do that, you create an image of somebody that might not be true. Because you're reading information, but there are other things going on at the same time. The only reason why he's in Harvard, he don't care nothing about that degree. He cares nothing about the education he's getting from Harvard. You've heard Dr. Jeffries talk about his, what was it? Billion dollar in, uh, uh, education? You, you heard that. William Leo Hansberry's not interested in this. He wants to read every book on Du Bois' bibliography. And unless you can get into that piece of it, which is in a letter in his home, you're going to miss the most important reason why he's in Harvard, and you're going to misinterpret why he does what he does as he goes through. He becomes a special student, which is non-matriculating. For those of us who have been non-matriculating, as myself and, and probably many of us, it means that you're not going for the degree. You're just taking certain credits that at some time down the road may go into your degree, but it's not going to your degree. He's not allowed in. However, in some of the letters that are written from, you see, this is the admissions department writing to different scholars. Will you accept William Leo Hansberry in your class? He's a wonderful person, but I just want to tell you, he's a colored boy. These are letters written that he doesn't know is being written at the time. There, is, there are teachers who write back to the admissions director saying, I'll accept him. There are others who say, I want no part of him. But he gets in as a special student. He goes away one summer, uh, the, the summer after being a non-matriculating student, and, he, and it's in Rhode Island, Narragansett Hotel, or motel. And he works as a presser, as a cleaner, he washes dishes, and he orders books, and he transports himself with this money from Narragansett in Rhode Island to Cambridge at the library. And he begins to continue to read the books. You're going to hear me say this constantly because this is what's driving him. It's not Harvard. He don't care if he's not matriculating. He wants the books. He wants this information. So he goes back again. They take him in as a special student. All of a sudden, in the second year, they decide that they are going to give him more courses than necessary. But now, Something else happens. Remember, this is around 1917, 1918, 1919, World War I. Since Du Bois had such an impact on Hansberry, what Hansberry does is he enlists in World War I. He serves in the Army for four months. He is, because of his college education, he is the uh, assistant to the commander on the base. And what he does is that he returns to Harvard because the World War I ends. He's only in four months before it ends. He returns to Harvard, but check this out. Because he served in the war, and because he's been a non-matriculating student, he's looked upon more with a little bit more pride. Respect. respect. There it is, Mr. Franklin. Respect. So they say, okay, we're going to take you in, and now you can matriculate. So he starts to matriculate. But now he's running out of money. There are letters that are in, in Howard University, in his home, where he's writing to a Major Higginson, who at that time is a European-American uh, philanthropist who helps African-American students. He writes to Major Higginson. Major Higginson writes to admissions. Registrar asks him, well, what, 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 what about this William Leo Hansberry? Is he worth in, uh, investing? They say, absolutely not. We've given him all the money we can. He's borrowed up to his neck. And he needs to go out, make more money, and then he can come back and devote his time to education. Obviously, since he's working, and since he's also uh, in school, he can't do both. He's not a good investor. Major Higginson writes back to William Hansberry, tells him, I'm sorry, uh, I cannot uh, support you. 
So what's the first thing William Leo Hansberry does? William Leo Hansberry works out his schedule because there is a special degree at that time that said if you completed three quarters of your coursework, which he did, and if you served in the war, you would get an SB degree, which was a war degree. He realizes with this degree, he can begin to teach as a full professor. <laughs> the brother is working. Isn't he? he gets his war degree, he's granted the war degree, and he is given office. He's given office from Atlanta University to work in the social studies department or social science at that time, or he can go to Straight College in New Orleans. He chooses Straight College because through a deal, and again, these are in the letters, he is given permission to develop a department of African studies. Oh. Hey, right on top. At this time, he is ready to take off. Prior to going to straight college, he visits a lot of different colleges, a lot of campuses, a lot of YMCA's, a lot of different areas, and he raises money for himself to be able to at least offset some of the money. It is in straight college that he begins his curriculum of correction. You know this same thing we're talking about in 1990? We're talking about 1921. He begins to develop a lot of different uh, articles, and he writes an article entitled The Material Culture of Ancient Nigeria. In this article, Professor Hansberry compares the West African artifacts and West African structures to the structures of East Africa and shows quite succinctly. Now, this is 1921. This brother's approximately 26, 27 years old. He shows the same thing that Dr. Sheikh Abdel Diop shows in that mat and another master's work, Dr. Sheikh Abdel Diop. He shows the relationship between West Africa and East Africa, and he uses the artifacts that he has seen to make this comparison. It's accepted. Whatever happens, he gets a little bit of notoriety, gets a little bit of credit, and what he begins to do is to teach at straight college. He also continues to write his curriculum of correction, because he's not going to give that up, because that's the thing he's working on. He raises enough money to go on a tour, and in North Carolina, he meets his third influence in his life. Let me go back. His first influence is his father. His second influence is his mother. His third influence is uh, Professor Hooten of the Peabody Museum. I'm sorry, his fourth um, mentor. His fourth mentor is Dr. Jesse Moore, who's on the board of trustees of Howard University. In North Carolina, Jesse Moreland hears this young brother talk and says, we got to get him at Howard University. No matter what we do, we got to get him here. Whatever it takes, we've got to get him here. We're going to get into some problems that he had, and you're going to begin to see why we must come together now. We must not fight among ourselves anymore. Because for those of you who have read about Professor Hansberry, you have read about two professors that had it out for him. And I don't know if you've ever been told their name, but he has written a letter, and I have it in my possession, where he names them. And I think you'll be surprised at who they are. Because these happen to be individuals that we today respect very greatly. I came upon some information three weeks ago that hurt me even deeper. Because there is a third scholar who plotted behind Hansberry's back to almost destroy him. And I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to tell you, my brothers and sisters, not because I want to create controversy, but because we must never let it happen. Professional jealousy must stop us. We must understand that it's the parts that make the whole. Yes. And if any part is out of sync, it's like if Jupiter goes out of its ecliptic orbit. Right. Our entire universe is destroyed. So we have to talk the truth, we have to name some names, we have to get into some interesting conversation. Yes. Because we got to talk and we, you know, we have to talk on it. And we have to talk in front of our young brothers and our young sisters so that we can understand and work it out so that it does not happen. Professor Hansberry tells Dr. Mullen, I'm not quite ready yet to go to Howard University. Some more things I want to do. So now he's got enough money. He returns to Harvard. And he works with Hooten again. Now, he's not going towards his 
bachelor's degree. He doesn't have his bachelor's degree yet. He still got this SB degree, but he wants to raise enough money so that he doesn't have to go through this nonsense anymore. So he begins to go back to Harvard and he begins to study, but he takes graduate courses, but these graduate courses don't go towards his bachelor's. These are just simultaneous courses he's taking to get himself through all of this. Finally, he decides to go to Howard. And he is notified by Jesse Morland. There's letters going back between Jesse Morland and Stanley Durkee and a whole bunch of other people. Uh, there's another gentleman, Dr. Charles Wesley, who was the, the director of the history department at Howard at this time, who also was a Harvard graduate with a PhD. And what's interesting is that Dr. Charles Wesley was going for his PhD when Professor Hansberry was going for his bachelor's. There's a great deal of respect between them and among them. And this is what is really on Professor Hansberry's side. What happens is that Professor Hansberry then uh, writes letters. Jesse Morland is telling him, write to Stanley Durkin, tell him this. He then says, write to Charles Wesley and tells him this. Then Charles Wesley is writing to, uh, Professor, uh, to Stanley Durkin. And there's a whole triangle thing going on here. This is what I'm talking about research. And these are the things that we must do. We cannot just go to one source and say we know it all. We've got to go from one source to another and almost make it like a detective story so that we can, un we can tell the truth, so that we don't make these mistakes again. Because we rely on certain people, and certain people, although they may be very scholarly, and they are, they're, they're saying it and they're not researching and going deeper into the causes and the effects. And when you go into the causes and the effects, Hansberry rises like the sun. He rises. You can see it in his writing. You can see it in his development. You can see it as he's talking to these people. He's learning to do his job, and he's doing it well. Professor Hansberry starts teaching. People are literally frightened. Mm -hmm. See, this is the Harlem Renaissance. We're talking about uh, the fall term of 1921. We're talking, I'm sorry, 22. We're talking about a lot of different things going on at this time. Let me take that back. It is the, he begins teaching at Howard during the spring term of 1922, but he begins the process during the fall term of 1921. So there's a lot of different things going on. He comes in, please know this is around the Hall of Renaissance. You've got a lot of people coming forward now. They're, people are paying attention to what they call the Negro intellectual. Mm -hmm. And what happens is here comes this Hansberg. Mm -hmm. He's got an SB degree. Oh, Elaine Locke. Elaine Locke is a Rhodes Scholar. He's proud of that scholar, isn't it? Rhodes Scholar. It's like someone of Jewish faith getting a Hitler scholarship and being proud of it. Thank you. Cecil Rhodes was the Hitler of South Africa. That's right. Murderer. We must be careful when we say we are Rhodes Scholar. It means nothing except you've spent money that killed your people. That's what a Rhodes Scholar is. Yes. Plus, you don't really learn much anyway. <laughs> because you're in universities that don't have the capacity to teach you what you need to know. This is why when our young brothers and young sisters are exposed to Dr. Jeffries, to Dr. Scoldy, to our sister Camille Yarbrough, to be in the presence of this kind of assembly, this is what education is about. See, education comes from, the, from a Roman word, a Latin word, educare, which means to bring out. And as the brother was talking about training, this is what we do to our children. This is what we do to our <laughs> students. We train them like seals. Hey, jump up here. You jump fish. Perform a trick, and you'll get a fish. Perform a trick, and you'll get a job. <laughs> That's the trick. We're training them. We are not educating them. We are not bringing the education out of them. Because I honestly believe from the African, the Kinetic perspective, that every child is born with everything they need to know. And as they go through the educational system, it is the fine-tuning of the teachers that brings this information out of them, that shows them this is what you have, this is what is here. When you bring them together, then you are like Atum. You have risen to the top. You have synthesized your thesis and your ant antithesis and you've been able, through a method of movement, been able to get an education. I had a friend graduate from Queens College. He said, Brother Booker, let me tell you, I got something that three quarters of my classmates did not get. I said, Brother Steve, what was that? He said, I got an education. And that was true, <coughs> because the brother was conscious. And unfortunately, most of our young people leaving college 
are not conscious. They are blind. And what we've got to do is to begin to bring out this information in them so that they become conscious and so that they become knowledgeable. You have William Leo Hansberry here. William Leo Hansberry is given permission because remember Jesse Morland's behind him. Jesse Morland is not only a graduate of, How uh, of Howard University, but he's on the board of trustees. He's looking out for him. William Leo Hansberry is like his buddy, his young son, that he's going to bring through this whole piece because at this time, Jesse Morland is trying to bring about, he's trying to pull out of the history department and African studies department because remember, as people of African descent, and I'm not saying this is generally true, but when you went into Howard, you did not learn African or African-American history. Mm -hmm. Anything you learned of the African or African-American history, you learned through history. Now, of course, that's wonderful in terms of the curriculum of correction, if we could infuse that. But unfortunately, in the history department, you did not learn those types of things. See, people were trying to speak Latin and Greek and all the rest of them things. You see, they go around campus. Can, can you imagine brothers and sisters walking around talking Latin and Greek to each other? We were hands raised with somebody, I want some metanecha here. Yeah. We some metanecha to talk. I don't want to talk no Greek and Latin, but he had to study it. He had to study it, first of all, to get accepted. He had to study it in order to be able to transcribe and, and understand what he was reading about in the Greek and Latin books that he'd grown up with. So he did it only as a means to an end. It wasn't the end. Yes. You didn't catch him talking Latin and Greek on the campus of Howard. But you did see him reading it when he was, had to read the book. So he did what he had to. But at the same time, he understood what he had to do. And this is what our young brothers and our young sisters have to do. They have to understand what it is that you have to do to get to where you got to go. You see, because we're not talking about just content here. We're not talking about, it's not interesting, it is not important for our young people to know about the pyramids. What's important is to understand that a society was put in place that allowed great people to rise. See, Imhotep is not important. It's the society that allowed an Imhotep to rise. This is what's important. Skill building with our young people. Critical thinking and reasoning skills. So that when they look at a newspaper or when they look at the news and then they see that many that look like them, that they cannot see their face because they've got uh, 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 coats over their head and they've got those um, bracelets on. You, you know those comedic bracelets they got out here now? <laughs> comedic bracelets. they got them all, all the time. That they can see and perceive that there's a reason why they're looking at this. And that they don't get mistaken and misunderstand what's actually being said to them. Critical thinking and reasoning skills. And this is what Hansberry was beginning to develop and begin to put in place at Howard University. He's given permission to start three courses on African history. And wow, that shook me. Never before had they ever heard anything. For instance, Negro people in the civilizations of the prehistoric and ancient world. <laughs> Negro civilizations in East Central Africa from the 8th century BC until the end of the 16th century. Negro civilizations in West, in West Central Africa from 900 AD to the end of the 19th century. This brother covered the gamut because he knew he could only do certain courses. So what he did is he structured them so that he could cover the whole piece. But as we go through this dialogue that we're going to do tonight, you are going to begin to see that what he really developed was an entire curriculum in place, but he expanded it as he went along. As the people who allowed him to do it, allowed him to do it, he expanded with them. The brother was a chameleon. The brother was an African chameleon who could adapt to his surroundings and be able to do for his people what was necessary. I don't need to tell you that within three years, he had already had over 812 students. And let me tell you something. He was only allowed to teach freshmen, and he taught a correspondence course. So it wasn't like he was even accepted, and his courses weren't mandated. But because of this brother's magnitude, and because of his presence, and I'm going to show you some slides of him because I think you need to see him. I'm sorry I don't have a tape of him, because I want you to hear him. I want you to be able to understand who he is, and the part that he has played in our life, and the fact that he is amongst us right now. He is with us. It is his work that has guided us, and it's important that we know this. Because the curriculum of correction was begun by him. And as I just told you, his courses that he had were the first courses in the history of this civilization that existed in any university anywhere in the world.
Professor Hansberry entitled, entitled his first curriculum at this time, An Introduction to Ancient and Medieval Civilizations. The areas he covered in his courses were Africans in Europe and Asia, Africans in Egypt and Ethiopia, the Zimbabwe culture, West Africa, and the Sudan. Has he missed it? No. This brother didn't miss it. Oh, did he? <laughs> True. The brother had it together. What began to happen was fear. Professional jealousy. There were people who were very serious. Not only were they lose their job, Sister Franklin, but you know what happened? There was a certain aura in Howard. You see, it's bougie there. It's still bougie. But back then, if you don't have a PhD, who are you? If you are a bachelor's degree, hey, you're not even in the game, and this doesn't have a bachelor's degree. He still had his war degree. So you know how they felt about him. So they began to plot. They began to plot Stanley Dirk, the president. But I'm going to tell you how the ancestors work. There are letters that are being written at this time between Jesse Moreland, Stanley Dirk, and Charles Wesley. The two people involved in this conspiracy, Elaine Locke and Ernest Just. They, uh, there is a letter that was written by Hansbury to Jesse Moreland, and he's saying to Jesse Moreland, he's saying, I don't understand. He calls it misdirected zeal and professional jealousy. He says, I do not understand why Ernest Just has told Dr. Stanley Durkee that he has invited me over to his home, sat down with me, and quizzed me on my knowledge of Africa. Because not only has he not invited me to his home, but every time we on campus, he turns his head when I come by. Mm. So people are not telling the truth. We all know Ernest Just. Don't we respect him? And didn't that brother do many great things? But you see, when Satesh, Satesh is in all of us. And what happens is that when professional jealousy begins to be to surface, when you begin to see that there is somebody who has a war degree, but has the kind of charisma that can bring people around to, to have 812, there's a letter that Professor Hansberry writes more, and he says, I may suspect that this might be the problem. And he goes on to say that we had a very successful summer school. I had 13 students in my anthropology class. I had 24 students in my history class. And unfortunately, Elaine Locke had zero. You see what's happening? The need for research to be able to go into these letters. And you see, this letter is not where you find it. This letter from Hansbury is in Jesse Moreland's file in the archives of Howard University's library, the founder's library. Now, if we were just dealing with Hansbury and we didn't get into the other people who impacted his life, and I want to say this to my brothers and sisters in research, if we had just gotten into Hansbury, because I pulled Hansbury's file, but I came upon someone by the name of Dr. Doris Hull, who is a librarian and history teacher at Howard and who was a student of Hansbury. And she said, well, you just don't want Hansbury's file. You want Jesse Morland's file, you want Elaine Locke's file, you want Ernest Just's file, you want a whole bunch of files. Because you're going to see some things happening here that's going to surprise you. See, I thought I had a, a, a zip, zip, zip uh, thesis here. I didn't realize that I had one of the first African-American soap opera series. <laughs> because that's what it is. It is those things that rise in us, no matter how great we are, no matter how wonderful we are, that pit us against each other. And then you have people who come in between us and begin to play games. So here's Stanley Durkee. You want to play some games? Hansbury stood back. Jesse Moore said, Hansbury, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. And as you know, Stanley Durkee was the last European-American president of Howard University. And it was because of Hansbury. <laughs> so if he, didn't, if he never did anything else, at least he did. <laughs> You see, Hansbury is dynamic. Mm -hmm. He has shown Dr. Morland that he's serious, that he's a scholar, that he knows what he's talking about. Yeah. Dr. Morland said, don't you mess with my man, because I will chill you out. Mm -hmm. And that's what he did. Stanley Durkee became the last European-American president of Howard University. And it, it was the, there were a lot of things that happened. Because first of all, the student protested when they brought charges against Hansbury. Mm -hmm. Students wouldn't go to class. You think that what happened with uh, Professor James Cheek was the first time it happened? It happened back in 1925. 
happened in 1924. And it was because the students didn't want any more part of what was going on. It wasn't just because of Hansbury. There was a lot of things happening at Howard at this time. And Hansbury was one of the things that had happened because he already taught 814 students. And they didn't want no part of this. They said no more. So there was a student uprising, there was the deal with Hansberry, and there was total inefficiency because, quite frankly, Stanley Durkee was not an educator. He was a preacher. And he was contracted to come up here and become president of Howard University. Unfortunately, that's not the first time we've had ineffective and moral people in places of position, unfortunately, leading us. But we do have Jesse Morland, and we do have Professor Hansberry to thank for that. So, Professor Hansberry in 1925, June 2nd and June 3rd, Professor Hansberry conducts a symposium. I would like to go through all of this. It would take a great deal of time, but again, all of this, you will get this information in time. But he goes through a 28-page symposium in 1925, where he covers from the very beginning of existence of the African world, which is the human world, to the period of bondage or hostage. You see, I like the word hostage nowadays. See, everybody uses the word hostage. You see, and when one hostage is, is thrown overboard, everybody gets upset. When 235 or 55 or something is like taken, everybody gets upset. How should we feel when 100 million hostages are taken and their children are still being mistreated? I think we should be concerned about that. And I think we should let them know that. Yeah, we do. But our brothers are. So we, we can see this happen. Yes. So it's important to know that Professor Hansberry at this time was beginning to evolve. Please know at this time he's also continuing to write the curriculum. He's also continuing to do a lot of different things. What he decides to do in 1929 is to go back and get his bachelor's degree. He takes a sabbatical. He goes back to Harvard University. And what he's doing is that he asks permission if he can take his requirements for his bachelor's and his master's at the same time. Harvard says no good. You've got to do your bachelor's first then do your uh, graduate. He finishes his bachelor's work, but the brothers have a problem with French. Serious problem with French. Just can't master French. Can't master French because it doesn't have the potential. He's too busy trying to get this curriculum together to put his mind into learning his language. His brother's trying to get into this history and this curriculum. And they keep telling him to speak French. He said, I'm not teaching French people in French. I'm speaking them in English, and I'd like to do this curriculum. They say, no good. You have to pass the language requirement. So what he does is that he asks permission, and he has Professor Hooten write a letter of permission if he can go ahead and take his uh, courses for his master's degree if they will just allow him to postpone the French exam for his master's. So when they hear from Hooten, they say, well, we've got to give in here. Okay, you can go ahead for your master's degree, but you have to take your French before you get your master's degree. What happens is that he works something out with Howard and Harvard, Instead of going to Harvard to take his uh, French test, he takes it at Howard. <coughs> he passes. I don't know how. <laughs> he passes it, gets his master's degree, and he continues his work. So the brother's very serious. The brother knows what he wants. Please understand something. This brother knows what he wants. This brother's on a mission. In fact, there have been articles written on Hansbury, and there is one article entitled, William Little Hansberry, a man in his mission. Yeah. <laughs> he knew what he wanted. He saw the vision. And all this out here wasn't going to get in his way. Elaine yeah. Locke wasn't going to get in his way. Ernest Just wasn't going to get in his way. Neither was the Toro Schomburg. Oh. Man, broke my heart. I'm telling you, he hurt me. Because we have all respected, and I still respect him. That's not going to impact, and it should never impact. If anything, let's draw the positive from the negative. Because in 1924, they opened up King Tutankhamun's tomb again. And there was a delegation sent over there to witness this. And Jesse Morland wanted William Leo Hansberry to go. But Elaine Locke said, but I'm a Rhodes Scholar. I don't care if you got more students than I do. I'm a Rhodes Scholar. I should go. <coughs> so Elaine Locke had done a favor for Arturo Schomburg in setting up uh, the Schomburg collection in terms of the books that Schomburg wanted. So Schomburg repaid the favor by writing letters to Stanley Durkee and strongly recommending that William Leo Hansberry do not go mm. and that Elaine Locke should be sent to this place. Mm. Unfortunately. Mm. But the one thing is, please take the good from the bad. Oh, uh, this is what we must do with what we have. Take the good from the bad and learn from it. 
So that as we begin to develop and as we begin to grow, that we do not let certain personalities get in the way. We must always suppress Setesh. Yeah. That's the Usirian drama. That's the story of the Usirian drama. Unfortunately, some of our brothers and sisters, for whatever reason, sometimes can't do it. And I stand before you as no angel. I have my problems. We all have our little thing here. And what we've got to do is just work on it. So that's what our ancestors told us to do. Yes, you may have your problems, but you see, the problem is not that you have the problem. You're allowed to make mistakes. You see, there's nothing wrong with having fear. A true man or a true woman is measured by what they do in face of that fear. So we don't try to become fearless. You see, when someone tells me they're fearless, I say, you're crazy. you guts to have fear. If you don't have fear, you're crazy. So you are not made by the fear you have. You are made by what you do in spite of that fear to overcome that fear. So instead of vibrating on the fear to become fearless, you vibrate on courage. And that's what we have to do, and that's what they should have done. Because as you can see right now, if them brothers had allowed Hansberry to do his thing mm -hmm. and support him, we wouldn't be here now talking about no curriculum of, of, of correction. In fact, quite frankly, I think they would be here talking about how they need to be included. But it didn't happen that way. We are here, and we got to do something about that. Okay. What began to happen in 1935, Professor William Leo Hansberry has written a lot of different places. He wants to be able to go to school. He wants to study at Oxford. He gets a grant to go to Oxford, but prior to going to Oxford, he studies at the University of Chicago to prepare himself. He studies during the summer of 1935 and 1936 at uh, the University of Chicago. He studies the work of James Breasted and all of the other work that's in the University of Chicago to get himself ready. However, uh, in Chicago, a yeah, love bug here. Oh, but that's good. That was wonderful for him. He said he had never seen such a beautiful African queen in his life. And a lot of people said that. A lot of people in the interviews that we conducted said the brother was swept off his feet. Yes, he tried to get that curriculum together. And yes, he loved that. Something touched that brother's heart. And I believe Myrtle Kelso. He met Myrtle Kelso. They were married. And um, he got, uh, they had their honeymoon in Europe because he studied at, at, at uh, Oxford. He returned and he was promoted, uh, when he returned 10 months later, he was promoted to uh, assistant professor in the history department and given two additional courses to teach. The brothers expanded. People and cultures of Africa in Stone Age times. Culture and political history of Nilotic lands and historical antiquity. Cultural and political history of Kushite or Ethiopian lands in the Middle Ages. Cultural and political history of the kingdoms and empires of the Western Sahara and the Western Sah uh, Sudan. And archaeological methods and materials. This was key because he wanted to train his students to take his place. He began to train them on the methods of archaeology. What do you do? I mean, you come upon a find. What do you do? What does it mean? What is carbon-14 dating? What is potassium argon? How is it that this means something? How do you know that it comes prior to whatever it is? So this course was very important that he began to add. He continues teaching at Howard University, but what happens, please remember, that the uh, World War II is breaking out. Now here's a very important part of Professor Hansberry's life, because you're going to understand the impact that this man had on the African world. He is contacted by Ethiopians because he is known at Howard University by this time as the father of African students. People, and another thing that, was, that goes throughout all of the interviews and the work that I've, I've seen on him is that he never trained them to remain here. He always taught them that their obligation was to return to Africa and to share with their people what he and others had taught them. They would, would return. For instance, the Ethiopian students would return. What happened was is that they sent a message through the grapevine that they needed Hansberry's help in Ethiopia because at this time, this is when Italy is encroaching itself on Ethiopia's sovereignty. Professor Hansberry gets some people together. He gets something called the Ethiopian Research Council together. And what happens, he sends a delegation. Mind you, this brother in the 30s, late 30s, sends a delegation over 
to check. Now, mind you, he's also working with the United States government. Mm -hmm. okay. Because in getting the monies and the funds needed to send these people over, he had to be able, because remember, Italy was not on the side of America. So they send him over, and Hansberry doesn't go. He says, you go. He calls William Steen off to the side, and he said, listen, now you go ahead and do what they tell you to do. Because you know what you got to do, because we need to find this out, and we need to free our brothers and sisters. But when you get over there, I want you to talk to some people, because they have some material for you. And he tells them what he wants them to say, that clue word. And once that clue word comes, all this material on African history is put into their hands. They return it to William Leo Hansberry in America. The Count Chiano becomes very offended that uh, William Leo Hansberry is about to finance Haile Selassie's visit to America. The Italian government gets angry and sends a letter to the United States State uh, Department and says, we take exception to William Leo Hansberry. The brother is powerful, political. He's not only an educator, but he's political. And as we go through this, there was something else I told Sister Irma I wasn't going to say, but brothers, you got me fired up this evening, yes. and we got to talk on it. So we're going to talk about his political activity because it's important that you understand what he was doing. Oh, he had something else. He had a vision. And like Dr. Clark says, you can achieve what you will as long as you don't go out in the street and run your mouth. Shut up. Do it. Don't say you your brother's keeper. Just keep it. And that's what Professor Hansberry did. Okay. Now. There is uh, an article appeared in Time magazine, and it's telling of how an Ethiopia traveling to Manhattan, Kansas, can't get a haircut. William Leo Hansberry says he wants to do something about this. And what he decides to do is that he sets up a council with the assistance of William Steen, James Grant, Robert W. Williams, Jr., and Henry, uh, Henrietta Van Noy, and William Gray. He organizes the Institute for African American Relations. You know that big, beautiful building down there by the U.N. called the African American Institute? Mm -hmm. William Leo Hansberry created. Mm -hmm. But you know why you don't know about it? Because in Washington, D.C., a group of European Americans said, well, uh, if we're going to get an institute going here, we need some finance. William Leo Hansberry and these European Americans make a deal. And this deal is you can go to New York and set up your financial arm of the African American Institute. We don't want it here. But in return, you must finance Africa. And I'm going to return to Africa House because that's very important. But at the same time that he's doing this, Goldie Seifert, Charles Seifert's wife, Charles Seifert and, and, and William Hansberry were very good friends. Goldie Seifert, after um, uh, Charles Seifert had passed away, called William Leo Hansberry and asked him if he would begin to develop a program of study, which he does. And what is most interesting is that it is here that Malcolm X walked in on William Leo Hansberry and began to get a sense, not only from studying with Dr. Clark and Dr. Ben and all of the other scholars that he studied with, but Malcolm X was also impacted by William Leo Hansberry at the Seifert Research Center. So when we begin to see Malcolm X budding in his Afrocentricity, it is not by mistake, it is by design. And he begins to see the development and the interaction. I'm not saying that William Lewis Hansberry was the reason why Malcolm did it. I'm saying that he was another influence in that great brother's transformation. Okay, now, this African American Institute begins to uh, support Africa. They have um, headquarters in Lagos, Nigeria, Dar es Salaam, Tanganyika, Washington, D.C., and New York. What they begin to do is miraculous. Nambi Ezekiel, first president of Nigeria, was a student of Hansberry's during the late 20s. Kwame Nkrumah was a student of William Leo Hansberry. Africa House was an underground revolutionary movement that taught Africans how to revolt against the colonial system. 
You can do anything as long as you're not in the street running your mouth. Kwame Nkrumah begins to bud. Other Africans trained in America, and, I, and I'm sure that you know far more than I, there are those scholars in this room who know the African scholars who studied in America, who studied at Howard University, who studied in these different areas in order to get an education. But everybody, no matter where they were in America, came to Africa House because everyone knew that was the Underground Railroad. William Leo Hansberry was not a man of talk. He was a man of action. And the reason why you may not know him, it is because he designed it that way because he knew if you knew this, they would know this. And if they knew this, they would snuff him out. So he was quiet. He let everybody stand up and get credit for all of these different things. Like when he, in 19, uh, 50, uh, 1953, received a Fulbright scholarship. And he went to Africa for the first time in his life. The brother went to Africa to study. And as he began to travel throughout Africa, and you've got to know the places that he went to because it's very important. During this time, he lectured and studied in Kenya, Uganda, Zimbabwe, Kinshasa, Ghana, Nigeria, Zanzibar, Tanganyika, Malawi, Zambia, and Liberia, not to mention the research he did in Egypt, where he was based with his family, in, in the Sudan, and, and in Ethiopia. This is what this brother did in 1953. <coughs> However, this was a, a, a Fulbright scholarship. When he returned to uh, Howard University, he came to realize that in his absence, Howard University had received a grant from the Ford Foundation to establish an African Studies uh, Department. And unfortunately, instead of uh, appointing Professor Hansberry, who would naturally be the person for this position, E. Franklin Frazier. Oh, oh. Oh. E. Franklin Frazier. No, I'm sorry, brother. I didn't mean to make you leave. <laughs> However, I must tell you, from all of the interviews and all of the things that have been said, the brother never held a grudge. Why didn't he hold a grudge? Because the brother had a picture. Yeah. I go back to that picture. Yeah, he knew what he wanted. Mm -hmm. He understood human nature. Mm -hmm. And he would let nothing get in his way. Yeah, but you know something? Despite the fact that E. Franklin Frazier was in charge of it, Despite the fact that all of these things had happened, that they had a whole bunch of scholars, there was a great deal of interest. Uh, the deal was that you would get Africa House, but you can only deal with the colonial period forward. They knew where Hansbury was coming from. He was ready to take them students back to uh, the Great Lakes region. <laughs> Making them rise up out of the Central Lakes region. They said, no, that's not going to happen. We, we want these African students to rise with change. Don't let them rise with the crown. They got the rise with those comedic bracelets. <laughs> Despite that, he had no problem. In 1957, he was contacted by a great historian to come to the new school to uh, teach an African study course, which he did. He became a very good friend, uh, and he became a mentor to this particular historian. And this man was Dr. John Henry Ford. And it was out of this experience that Dr. John Henry Clark and I sat down in 1983 and discussed William Leo Hansberry, and I got a sense of where he was coming from. Hansberry retired from Howard University in 1959. Believe it or not, Howard University still owed him money that they refused to pay him. Uh, they did not treat him right. Myrtle Hansberry did not care for Howard University, but despite that, Professor Hansberry had a smile on his face because, for one thing, when he left Howard University, they did have an African Studies Department, and his vision was clear that although it was starting at the colonial period, he knew that there would come a time when people would go back, and brothers and sisters would go that we have to realize that as Professor Hansberry taught Professor Clark, Professor Clark teaches us yeah. and we teach our young brothers and sisters. <laughs> this is the continuum. This is the map that was laid out for the curriculum of correction. So before I even get into the curriculum of correction for next week, we have to deal with this.
so that you can understand clearly the map, the road, and those diversions that will destroy us. Nothing must stop us. Our young people are ready. They are like sponge and water, dry sponge at that. They are ready. They are willing. They are able. And I'm telling you, when I heard these young brothers doing that rap, I couldn't help but go back to Africa and hear Griot. Right. They, they are training to be Griot. Right. That's what rap is. When they were doing breakdance, breakdance is capoeira yeah. from Angola. Yeah. Everything that goes around comes around. Mm -hmm. We are standing now in the same place that <coughs> Professor William Leo Hansberry stood. But the one thing that we must promise ourselves is that this time they will not stop us. Because I'm telling you, our children are ready. But on the other side of that being ready, our children are dying. When a child can be shot in the bosom of his or her grandma, when they can be shot in the stomach in their own house, we need to do something. But please, we're facing negativities. But please understand, don't get caught up in crack. You don't have to worry about crack. Marcus Garvey showed us that we could go off alcohol, which was the crack of his day. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad went into the prison. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad took people off heroin. That was the crack of that day. You see, the drugs get worse in terms of its ability to addict us because of what Kwame Tori says. They see us rising. And for those of us who remember drugs in our community, I remember when drugs came into the projects down there in Lincoln Center where I live. I remember when it came. It came when the brothers started standing on the corner and instead of singing do up, they started singing do right. <laughs> Let's get it on. That's when drugs came in. Crack is in our communities, not because we're susceptible to it, but because they hear what our young brothers and sisters are talking about. That's why crack is here. And if we can get to our kindergarten children and our first grade children and our second grade children and get them through a continuum of education from a committed point of view, there will be no stopping us. And for those of us who are teachers in this room, we are on the front line of this war. And I can tell you that our children are ready. They are beautiful. And you heard Dr. Jeffy talk about the troubles of District 9. <laughs> I'm from District 9. And I'm on camera, so I'm not going to say too much about District 9. But I will tell you that the children of District 9 are like the children of District 5 here in Harlem, And that they're ready. And in my research and what I've seen so far, the only ones that are not ready are the adults. Our children are ready, and we must pray and meditate on this. And we have to ask the spirits of Professor William Leo Hansberry, Carter G. Woodson, Sheikh Abdiya, all answers. We must ask William Leo Hansberry to come forward and to resurrect himself in us so that our young people can resurrect us as Heru resurrected Lucia. Shemem Hotel, our moon is satisfied. Institute for Youth. 
because the Institute for Youth, under the direction of and the leadership of our elder sister Irma Lean, what we did is that uh, I wrote an artwork that I had done in leather to sell to begin a fund to put his work in acid free folks. It is literally deteriorating. Mm. Literally. And this is another thing I want to tell you. You see, we don't need a, a Herbert Affleck. We need to do it ourselves. Thank you. This brother has got a basement and an attic full of maps, of graphs, of lithographs. That's right. And I've been in contact with the daughter constantly trying to let her know. But in answer to your question, there is a wonderful array of information that Hansbury has put together. And when we begin, and, and when I can get finally this published and let you see what it is, because I extracted some of the more important pieces, yeah. you're going to begin to see some dynamic information this brother has. But I just want to tell you this and answer your question. You see, we're talking about the education in terms of, uh, uh, we talking about uh, William Leo Hansbury in terms of the education, he's being a teacher. Right. We have spoken in terms of his political aspirations of what he did politically in his house he has got two thick volumes on African theosophy as I see it do I have to tell you more? no, no. no. let me tell you something this brother was aware of the collective unconscious and the point wait see I had heard Richard King speak about the collective unconscious first word of life yeah but when I read Professor Hansberry work, I went straight to the top. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> and there was no problem anymore in understanding yeah, was... what it is that we have to do. Yeah. This brother understood philosophy. He understood theosophy. And he understood what happens when you take the spirit and the body and you have a vision and you take the method. He has two pieces on theosophy and it's handwritten. Mm -hmm. oh. And it's in the back. So that if you did come, you see the file drawers when you walk down in the basement, you come this way. The file drawers are up against this wall, and he has file drawers up against that wall, 25 altogether. The theosophy piece is in the back, way in the back. So that the chances are he figured that when you walk in, and which I did, the first I went right to the left. For me to get to where the theosophy was, I would have had to really been interested in this brother. Mm -hmm. You understand? Right. You know how the Africans did it in Kemet? Mm -hmm. You know when you go into Abu Simbel mm -hmm. and, you're, and you're looking at the Battle of Kadesh? Mm -hmm. If you are of, of consciousness, you can understand what the Battle of Kadesh is. But if you are not of consciousness, you're not going to understand what that says. You're going to think that's a war between people, which it may have been, but that's another kind of war. The same is true for his view of theosophy which is spirituality. The brother was on top. And he needs to be not only remembered, not only revered, but resurrected. Yeah. Because he's a very important force in our life. And although he is unsung, we sing his praises tonight. So therefore, you will be putting uh, together uh, I have a base fund. And I would like, you see, being from District 9, I don't like to touch other people's money. I, I've, I've learned that. I would like Gail Hansbury to be contacted. I would like Kay Hansbury to be contacted. Because, you know, they suffered. The family, I've not even talked to you about what the family had to go through. They suffered a great deal. And I think that that should be purchased from them. And that needs to be put in acid-free folders, on microfiche. And what we've got to do is make a copy for them to keep forever. And take his work and put it so that it will be with us forever. Thank you. So that they can inherit it. That's right. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. You know, as time goes on, I will I will give information. I will contact Gail. If, if there are groups of us who are willing to support this venture, I will contact Gail and I will put something in place to make this happen. But we collected these kinds of funds with the Institute for Youth because we felt that it was so important that it comes from us and that we resurrect him and that we are in control of what happens. Because I'm telling you, don't let that theosophy, don't let those theosophy books get out of your hands because you're giving away a lot of secrets. And I don't need to tell you about his Masonic Conventions. I'll leave that for another one. <laughs> I have one question. 
Um, I think Sheikh Anza Jeff mentioned that uh, the African uh, experience is not a, there's, there's no part that's really lost, it's all there. And, um, and this brother, you, you've spoken up tonight, I've heard in passing that this is a revelation. And I'm wondering now, how, how can we put some of this knowledge in, in, in a working, functioning uh, apparatus? That maybe, you know, because there's so much that we have, you know, we're rich, <laughs> you know, we're marvelously rich. But somehow we don't use our riches to enrich us. My brother, that's why I'm coming back next Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> that's why this had to be done in two parts. And that's why I thank Dr. Jeffries for allowing me this time, these two weeks, because we could never have done it in just one. And when we get together next week, you'll see why. Because next week I'm going to lay out, let me say one other thing. <coughs> And the people who were part of the Institute for Youth will bear me out on this. I studied under a particular professor to get my thesis done. Everything that Professor Hansberry stood for was what he tried to stamp out. I did not know this. But when I began to read Professor Hansberry's work, Sister Halima Ma was telling me hey, there's a group called ASCAP coming together. They're going to have to study. And they, they, they're they going to start a curriculum. Uh, why don't you take part? I said, no, my sister Lima, I, I have to do this um, thesis. You know, I'm really working on this. I started working on Professor Hansberry's thesis. And what happened is I had to put it down. Because Professor Hansberry, now, please don't get me wrong on this. I'm not telling you that I started hearing voices. But I could hear him say, stop writing about me and write about what I tried to do. So I immediately put in place a curriculum. I put the thesis down. I have five years to do this or I'm going to lose my job. Because as a teacher, when you're appointed, you have five years to get a master's degree. If you don't get it, you lose your license. But something compelled me to put this down. His brother was telling me, forget me. Listen to what I'm saying, man. You're missing my point. <laughs> His writings were so clear on the curriculum and what you have to do to administer it. I put my thesis down and I started a curriculum. Okay, now all of a sudden come, <laughs> this is my fourth year. So I said, I'm sorry, Professor Hansbury, I'm working in the institute. Hey, tell me something. The people, they said, how many times I tell you I had to leave to finish my thesis? I said, at least three times I got to go to finish. So let, let me go and do this. I would go home. And Professor Hansberry would smack me upside right. my head. Right. Of course, I speak in jest. I'm on, you see, yeah. people yeah. use that. Right. Right. I say this in an analogy. Right. Because as I would get back into it, he'd say, put it down, man, and get back into the Institute for you. Right. I'd call Sister Irma next day. I'd say, Sister Irma, listen, you know, I know you think I'm fickle, but I'll be there on Saturday. I did this at least three times. At least three times. But this is the impact Professor Hansberry had. And you are absolutely right. And may I tell you something else, which might be a little frightening. I hope you take this right. It makes absolutely no difference if we resurrect his work. You know why? Because we're already resurrected. And that's his story. You got everything you need. We're already rich. We're born with it. All you have to do is Adam Clay Powell says, you put your hands down. But we will resurrect it, and we will do what we have to do. But even if we don't, we have everything we need to rise. All we need to do is put it in place. Next week, we're going to get it on. Let's get it on. We're going to get it on next week.
caution. <laughs> eyes open. Remember I said yesterday we got to have our eyes open when we approach these things? Because I was doing a piece and I'm working on a piece on courageous Jewish scholars. See, because they want to call you anti semite so you got to take that and use that. Courageous Jewish scholars who have um, <laughs> broken through in terms of this whole African history that most Jews have cognitive dissonance and, and relationship to. We gotta understand that. Those people we call European Jews cannot deal with the Nile Valley because their very essence, everything they learned about, their collective consciousness or unconscious is at stake. So when we talk about the Nile Valley and the significance, we're creating a monster for them. These teachers cannot deal with this. <laughs> and it takes a special courageous Jew to deal with them. And most of them have been haunted. Which means they've already gone through the metamorphosis of getting rid of that thing you know, about dealing with them. And so there's a whole uh, string of them. Uh, book of mention at that. If you heard uh, Gary Bird uh, last Monday, you had another one, William Katz. Mm -hmm. So since you gave me a note, I really appreciated you taking me in. You know, what he had to also write was, I knew that our people always attack the wrong part. In other words, he was saying attack on me, which he had accepted to a certain extent. Once he saw me, the truth was manifest. He could not accept that which he had read in the New York Times. So at least I have that. There's a lot of things that have that. You'd be surprised that Jews have sent me the material on Jews and the slave trade, the Statue of Liberty, and all that stuff. The Jewish people that have called and given me the information. So there's a whole series of the Aztecs and the uh, Cats and Melvin Hurst. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but I always wanted to be able to put an African inspiration under these Jewish guys. And when I found out that Herskovic, you want to give a lot of credit to because he was a Negro, he contested the French inflation, who said that the African didn't have, the African American didn't have African residual. That we were Negroes, and that's why it's ironic that he was asked to head the African studies when he had waged this battle against us having an African group. And so here you had Herskovic contesting this outstanding. African style. When I, like Booker said, you got to read the documents. You got to go get the, the, the original resources. You got to uh, understand the dynamic of causation. The reason why Hershkowitz got into looking at the African past of Africans in the New World was because Alain Locke pushed him in that direction. And there's a documentation that shows that he, Alain Locke asked him to write a piece on African residuals. And when Herskovitz studied the thing and came up with a piece that there's no African residual. That we are Negroes, just like every other American. We've been processed into this Americanization. And then it was Alain Locke that pushed him to look further into this thing. And once he got hooked on the African thing, then Herskovitz went on his own. So there's a dynamic relationship between these individuals. But Brooke was saying the formulation is not to get mad and not react correctly, but to see this as part of a, of a dynamic process and take out that which you could <coughs> to know, because the same dynamic that he's talking about which was taking place in the academic arena was taking place in our communities publicly around Marcus Garvey and W.E.B. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And it was the same type of, of, of dynamic <coughs> of, of where we come from, of color, um, class status, European degrees, um, that type of thing. So the beauty that we have now is that our people have gone through that process. And now we have a concept of sisterhood and brotherhood which the others didn't have. Scholars used to hide their work. We used to try to fool people. We have a situation where we share. Booker said, here, take this here, but don't put this out for the whole new command. Here, take this, do it, this, do it. And we have a whole other molecular scientist says, take this or I'll help you do this. And Van Settler says, look, come on, you have to do this, do this, and create an African, a journal of African civilization. Uh, Obanga comes from the, from the east and sends Van Settler an 800-page manuscript on his African philosophical 
800 page message. And the government just kind of published 100 pages here and here, 200 pages here and here. I'm sure Abanga is uh, continuing to write because he's head of a Bantu civilization center now, which was presented in this room at this conference table by the Minister of Health and Information uh, of uh, Gabon in here. And then uh, eventually uh, Abanga, one of the greatest scholars on the African continent alive today, uh, headed it. He's the heir on the continental side of Dr. Shekhar. Yeah. So what we're saying, this stuff is passing on uh, in relationship to uh, our special relationship, this brotherhood, this bonding that we have, this, this African family. When we went this summer to Ivory Coast, uh, Yango Bua wasn't there, but his wife was there. First thing we did, we only had a couple hours, was to run into the house. We didn't, she had prepared dinner. We asked her, from my wife and I, I said, we ain't got time for dinner. We want to get to see his research. Where is it? <laughs> and I knew where it was because when I went over there a few months before, he had exposed it to me. and had actually given me documents to bring back here. And I'm hoping to eventually get him to come here for food. But he has discovered, you know he discovered the gold weight. That's the three volume study that all of you should have. Mm -hmm. That was very costly, $95 a volume. But it is a fundamental study. Yeah. And one of the important parts of it is that the, the Ramadan, the Banshee uh, food, the Swastika, is our sacred symbol of the male and the female principle, uh, particularly in relationship to the rulership. So it's ironic that Hitler has taken that. So in the New York Times, when they made the attack, and Virgil put that message in the time, and one of the things he said, Jeffrey's said that the swastika is a sun people symbol older than Jews themselves. That's right. You know, when some Jews that have some knowledge to see that, 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 that tears at their inner. <laughs> and anybody would even have that knowledge, much less pass it on to uh, young minds. But Bura has published it. This is in his three volume study. But he had said a few years ago, he said, the study on the archive, that's yours. You're always on the deck. I'm into something else. And I, he didn't tell me what it was up until uh, a while ago. And he's discovered an ancient African civilization in West Africa, around the Bandama River in the Ivory Coast, going back to five to seven thousand. Ooh. He's got megalith heads that were carved out of the very rock. I mean, he has a hundred of them. He has them in his living room. That's why I was rushing him now. He has them in his courtyard. He has a dozen in his courtyard. And he has a separate building for his library. He has them alone. My wife has it on. And this is what this brother was, was into. He had discovered uh, this culture going back thousands of years in West Africa. That's a missing piece of a cultural link that runs from Senegal through uh, Nigeria. And this piece is in the center of it. So it shows a cultural sweep in West Africa. So there may be things that we have. We've been looking to the Nile because the things came together. You had your thesis, you had your antithesis, dealing with the negative and building this enormity of the of the zenith, which Dr. Ben says, coming from Nubia, uh, Ethiopia, and, and the zenith. And so we had a system uh, that sustained itself for thousands of years. And we don't look seriously at West Africa in terms of ancient foreign. But there's an ancient culture and civilization in West Africa that's a complement to this that was in, in East Africa. And of course, in Southern Africa, we were in Zimbabwe, we went to, uh, we really haven't even clocked that in. Mm -hmm. But when we went to Zimbabwe, we thought we were running through the great Zimbabwe ruins. And the Citadel and all that, but there are 200 stone cities in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. The sites of 200 stone cities, not just the great Zimbabwe. So there's a whole cultural dynamic that we can unfold if we put our minds to it, and Booker has provided us with an important piece, that there are people that once you start to study what their role and mission was, and you capture their vision, and you add it to your insight, then the dynamic that you have is an enormous one. So because you're building on that particular strength. And so we can see it happening now. Well, that's just something with nothing to the actors you mentioned. He's come into it from communication. And now he's going, he's going so fast, you know, we have to hold him back. He's going back. You know, and he published, I don't know how he published all his books, but he was in communication. So he's taking his communication skills and he's producing a book every six months. <laughs> you know, Van Sotoma has given up teaching. 
He's taking time out. He's on the road. He's taking his show on the road. Not only in America, he's going over to Holland, he's going over to Germany, he's going over to Russia, he's going over to Paris. In other words, this thing that we're talking about is international. It is not international. Moving into the African component universalizes that. And so that means we become the people who can synthesize all of it on the planet to make it make some sense. So that's where the Hansberg knew there was something way out there. He probably didn't know all the fundamentals of it. But what the upset was, you go back and you deal with the tradition, you deal with the current manifestation. So he was able to take the ancient Nile Valley and then relate it to, and I have a book in my office, where he deals with the linguistic connection with his own people in Senegal to the sacred language of the Nile. But he said you have to go to the top, you have to rise like a phone, and you have to make it an operative scientific principle. That's when we, when we put that circle when we talk about systems, we're talking about making it an operative scientific principle so that it becomes a transformative process, so that it has a system capability to sustain itself. And even when it's attacked, it has the regenerative capability of regenerating itself. A system, an operative scientific principle, makes this whole process into a dynamic system relationship. So that's where we're going. So curriculum inclusion was what our boy Don Smith put on the document as a political ploy. We're talking about a curriculum of correction, a curriculum of truth and the interaction of these dynamics, this complementary opposite, is a curriculum of liberation. So that's really where we're at. A curriculum of correction, a curriculum of truth, which will liberate us. So we're on our way. This is just a, some of the steps that we're taking. So I'm glad the brothers were here. And our sisters are here. We've got to get our daughters of Africa right tied into this process. And, um, and a book of what a special life. And it's not unusual that Schomburg and Just and Elaine Locke were caught in the situations that they're in. Because, as I said in this, again, there's that multi-billion dollar African education that begins in the beginning with my mama and continues through that community in Newark and on to Dr. Clark and Dr. Bed, etc. And then there's the antithesis, the million dollar white boy education, the big lie of white supremacy. And then as you interact with two, we have an enormity now. You see, and that's what Diop has done in his great book, which is coming out, Civilization for Far Reason. It deals with the Greeks in a way that the Greeks will never be the same. So I hope we can get this thing covered. In other words, his analysis of Greek civilization and culture will mean that can never be put on a pedestal again. And then, because the whole concept of genetic pruning, he demonstrates the documentation of what they have to teach life. Killing off the children. These northern Greeks coming in as warriors dominating the southern Greek and genetically pruning them to keep them at 40,000 slaves. But genetically pruning the Spartans themselves to keep them at 10,000 warriors. Killing off the women children, because you only need one woman to produce a lot of kids. And killing off certain men children that didn't meet the prototype. Hitler before Hitler. In other words, Tiap gets into that in a serious way. I've never seen it done that way by anybody else. But that's just a, a part of his thing. His heavy thing is getting deep into what Nile Valley culture, civilization, philosophy was and the legacy that we have. But you have to balance out the negative and the positive to create that the new, the new positive charge. So that's where we're moving. Well, I'm very happy to see it happening. Um, I'm glad the brothers came and make sure we got it on, on some type of tape. I'm glad Diane is here so she can get a taste of it. And too bad Adelaide wasn't here so she could just sit and, oh. and be in her glory. So Brothers and sisters, I brought 19 slides for Professor Hansberry. I got so carried away, I forgot to show no, you. Have to, no, no, we have to show. I was going to ask you that, but I, you have to show. Because we, we try to leave it'll, around. It'll take, it'll take about five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There's a question. There's a question. There's a question. Excuse me, there's a question. 
My question, my question is about the actual material you started to make. In other words, how is that? I want to learn about these technologies. I can pick it up. Yeah, I can pick it up. What happened was that everything that he did, the, the, the question the brother asked is where was his research? How did Hansberry get all of this information? What he did was that he was sparked by Du Bois, uh, Felix Du Bois, and W.E.B. Du Bois. And what happened was is that he read a lot of, of his own books from his childhood in terms of ancient Greece and Rome. That, that was his beginning. But where he got most of his information from and J.A. Rogers together. Mm. J.A. Rogers, uh, he worked with all the heavyweights. Uh, he was in contact with Drusilla Dungy Houston when she wrote her book, Wonderful Ethiopians. Uh, James Spadey did a, a comparative piece because remember, Drusilla Dungy Houston was impacted by Du Bois' as The Negro also. And that's what spurred her on. So what's most interesting is that here you have a woman, I think she was in Oklahoma, and you have a man that is in um, Mississippi, being impacted by this one book, and they're both rising to become scholars in their own right. A lot of writings in terms of a lot of the scholars, but most of it came from the Greeks and the Romans. Uh, he has a book, James, um, Professor Joseph Harris wrote a book, Africa and Africans, as seen by the classical writers. And in this book, you can see Professor Hansberry's writings from where he got the Greeks, like Pliny the Elder, uh, Herodotus, uh, Calisthenics. A lot of different writers began to write that he was impacted by, but then he began to depart from that. Charles Seifert, George G.M. James. Um, I, I have a list, and I'll bring it in for you next time to, to show you who, who, who was impact. Du Bois was a big impact. But what was interesting is that when Du Bois did The World in Africa, Hansberry wrote the piece on Ethiopia in The World in Africa. And Du Bois gives him credit in the beginning for using Hansberry's work. Uh, Hansberry was invited by Du Bois for the fourth Pan-African Conference to speak on the evolution of the African presence in the world. So he was impacted by a lot of different people and it was scattered just like it's scattered today. But what's happening, and I think that what all the scholars are doing and what Dr. Van Sodom is very good at doing, is that he's bringing all of these scattered pieces. You know like you see his body? You know like <laughs> Peru's eye? Right. <laughs> Bring it all together and by the magic of Tahuti, He's making it one. And so what we've got to do is go in, and this is what uh, Professor Hansberry was saying. He said, you have to go into archaeology, anthropology, uh, and he even said you have to go into somatology. I had to look that one up back there, and I didn't know what somatology was, the study of the blood. See, this brother was into melanin, and I, and I could show you some things in terms of his...